Welcome to Teaching Theater, a podcast about the practice and pedagogy of theater education, produced for HowlRound Theater Commons, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide. I'm your host, playwright and theater professor, Elizabeth Gregory Wilder. Welcome back to Teaching Theater. On this episode, we'll be talking about how we teach difficult material in the classroom. I'm excited to welcome two of the smartest and maybe funniest people I know, Darren Kennedy and Megan Gogarty. Darren Kennedy's work has been seen at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, the Alliance Theater, the Horizon Theater, American Conservatory Theater, the Aurora's Theater, Chicago's Congo Square, Premier Stages, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and London's Old Vic. He's an alum of Carnegie Mellon University, New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and the Juilliard School. He's currently an ensemble member of American Blues Theater, a core writer at the Playwright Center, and teaches playwriting at the University of Kansas. Darren, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. And we have Megan Gogarty, a playwright, stand-up comedian, and professor at the University of Iowa Playwrights Workshop, where she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in playwriting and comedy studies. Her latest one-person show is called The Once and Future Emma Goldman Clinic, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first abortion clinic to open east of California, the Emma Goldman Clinic in Iowa City. Megan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So we all teach classes in playwriting and script analysis, which means we have to teach students how to read plays. So maybe we should start there. So how do we read plays? Or rather, what do you want your students to think about when they're reading plays? I hope this is useful. I, so I teach playwriting within the auspices of a creative writing program that's within a department of English. And so a lot of my students end up coming to playwriting after experiencing writing and reading uh, in other genres. And I think the first thing that I end up trying to get them to, to move their minds towards is it's called a play for a reason. We call it a play, not a read. And to try to, to think about the ways that sound, life, what is fl like the flesh, the vividness of it, how to think about what's on that page as a two dimensional capture of something that's experienced hopefully <laughs> as messily and as um, vividly as possible in three dimensions. Um, so I think that that's maybe one of the first things is to rethink the notion of what we mean by read uh, is one of my first steps. Yes, I super agree. And in fact, this year I'm doing something fun. I'm excited about what I'm doing, which is <laughs> traditionally the way I've taught script analysis is they go and read the play by themselves and then they come to the classroom and then we talk about it or do an exercise about it. And this year we're just flipping that on their head and that they're going to come to the classroom and we're all going to read it aloud together. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to go home and do whatever exercise or 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 reflection or whatever I want to do. So we're just sort of inverting that because uh, I want my students, just like Darren, to understand that a play is a thing that happens in time. And I have said, I don't know how many times, countless, every year, you should get together and read this aloud. You should get together and read it aloud because there are plays that they just don't get unless they read it aloud. Frankly, and frankly, some plays are hard to understand. Yep. if they're just read on the page. Like it, that's a real skill that sometimes I think those of us who are professionals sort of forget that that's a whole thing to learn. And so then I'm like, why do I keep suggesting this? Why don't I just make them do it? And the other thing I'm excited about <laughs> is by doing it this way, then they'll actually have to read the play. So we teach them how to read the play um, and we want our students to grow and challenge themselves. So we assign the material that asks big questions and digs deep into uncomfortable topics. So how do we approach that difficult material in the classroom, especially when that material leads to difficult conversations? I'd like to question what, why are we using the word difficult and what, and what we, where we put that, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about, it's one thing to talk about the isms of our world it is another thing to label someone's identity and the presence of that identity as difficult. 
I right. love that. Right? Like, so just because we are talking about queer folks, just because they're indigenous folks in the piece, okay, we're gonna have a difficult conversation. Immediately connects in the student's mind, okay, that identity is difficult. I'm like, I want us to, to step away from that and get to the place of saying, okay, this is outside of your experience, sure. And I'm gonna need you to, to dig, dig down deep and start to develop some new toolbox, uh, new tools within your toolbox. Some of us call it empathy. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I am finding a lot of times there are colleagues both within our field and outside of our field again you know i'm teaching within creative writing and also experiencing colleagues right outside of it like well it's it's a black piece so we're gonna have difficult conversations like oh is it or is it just a play about a family as a starting place you know um, it also depends on who is in the room and and what they are coming in with and, and where they are. So teaching freshmen is very different than teaching graduate students, for example. Um, and I teach at a primarily white institution, but it's not an exclusively white institution. So mm -hmm. if we're having conversations about race and racism, um, thinking about who is in the room and what's their lived experience coming in is going to, um, you know, there's, there's some students I have to kind of educate more about sort of like the basics of American society. And there are other students <laughs> who are already prepared to have that conversation. So there's a lot that's, I don't know if there's a one size fits all answer to that question. I'm in a weird place, right? Because I am at a predominantly what definitely a PWI. Um, and for many of my students, I am one of the first black instructors they've ever had and perhaps one of the their first out queer instructors all in one very interesting body right so they're like oh we and so one of the starting places is to create a space where no one feels like like try to get people to start conversations where they don't have to be profound what hit you what caught you what are you paying attention to? And to bring the skills of the close reading to the text, both when I'm introducing plays and when they're working with their own scripts. And what I mean is like saying, I felt this thing and me constantly saying, when, when, yes. when, get into the text, get into the text, as opposed to needing to be like, you know, obviously this is a, this is a, a response to the, you know, this presidential nominee, da, 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 like, okay, yes, you felt a thing. And whatever you felt is what you felt. That I'm not gonna fight you on that. Where is that in the text? What did that do to you? Where did that come from? And similar with the performance, right? if I take you to a show, if I take, which I require, what were the moments that popped for you? Why were you in it? Where did you, you might have felt great, you might have felt awful, but why? What in the text? What in the piece? And so it then, whatever the topic is it is about the shared either text or shared experience which allows the conversation to move a little bit forward i'm not saying it's always a success but those are two tools that i try to to keep on the track at the same time that's huge darren that is huge and let me um co-sign it uh i think that one of the hardest skills especially for people who are not actors is to approach plays inside their own bodies Oof. and can we articulate the experience that we are having not the our intellectualizing of the experience we think we should have right mm. like i get really frustrated with conversations about the symbolism of a play i get <laughs> i get really frustrated because uh, that's a, that's a, a very um that's a very literary analysis which is lovely and great but we are in the theater and i want an embodied experience i want you to be able to speculate what is the embodiment where did you feel nervous where did you get excited where did you feel lost like what are the feelings and can we start there can there. we articulate what the feelings are and i find that that question is difficult for 18 year olds 
but it's also in some ways more difficult for my graduate students. Uh -huh. I have some graduate students who are so, I mean, because they're scholars, right? Like they're on their way to become, you know, professors. And so they're ready to, you know, drop the $10 words and the, the liminal dichotomy of the blah, blah, blah. Like they're waiting, <laughs> they're waiting for that, right? And it's like, okay, but like, how do you feel in your gut? Right, like get in the body and articulate from there, because from there, while your body is, but you you don't have to be the expert on all theater to be an expert on your own experience, and yeah. it's 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 the uh, the first way in to any play is is your embodied experience, and then we can contextualize and blah blah blah, because you'll get students, especially if it's a play that is way outside their comfort zone, where their embodied experience is to go, no, thank you, I don't want yeah. it, I don't like it. In which yeah. case, great, let's let's talk about that, right? But until we talk about that, we can't really go forward. And any conversations about context and blah, blah, blah become intellectual exercises. You know, you actually, Megan, thank you for saying that. Like, I do feel both within the confines, Elizabeth, of the conversation that, that, that we're setting up here around controversial topic, uh, controversial content uh, or, or difficult content, both there and more broadly, I am moving to a place of trying to create a more holistic space in the classroom. And I think, Megan, that's exactly what I hear you say. Like more and more, there's a great colleague of mine, Megan Kaminsky, who's a poet who does, I do check-ins just as like, here's a, here's a warm up question. Um, at the top of class and the top of workshop, Megan actually does physical the physical exercises that really allow you to check in with your body, right? And I, and of course, for theater makers, particularly as Megan pointed out, for those that are coming from performance and directing backgrounds, that's warm up, right? That's you must check in with the body to do the work. And I would love for us to move that over to also the script work so that we're not separating as megan points out the cerebral from the lived experience because ultimately that's what we're trying to get at right and i my supposition is that if we're checked in we're going to be paying attention to each other more as well which is part of what makes those conversations so tense sometimes is when people feel isolated alone am i the only person who thought this was racist? Am I the only person who doesn't know what's happening in this scene because the characters are Asian or from this other subgroup? Am I the only person who doesn't know why the play was written? And if we're checked in, we start to be a little bit, I think, a little bit more open and a little bit more receptive to the energies that are happening around us. So people have a lot of big feelings about the term trigger warnings, um, <laughs> which uh, especially when it comes to theater, um, which is really made to be triggering in some way, right? It's meant to be this cathartic experience. How do you guys feel about that? Yay, nay, like um, I can tell Megan has has some thoughts on this. It's my time to shine. Amen, amen, take it away. <laughs> so I, I have a, a, a whole soapbox about this. So bear with me. I think it's important, sometimes what gets lost in this conversation about um, should we have trigger warnings and should we not have trigger warnings is this understanding of what a trigger warning is and, and what a trigger is, right? Uh, and so it's useful to remember just, you know, quick back of the napkin um, context is that a trigger is a word that is associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? It is part of the trauma response. And the idea is, let's say you're a veteran and you've come home from the war and you have PTSD from all of the shooting of the people that you had to do. And one day you're in the, you're in the, you know, convenience store parking lot and a car backfires and uh, your brain thinks you're in combat again. Even though you're not in combat, you have a physiological response. You are triggered and you are pale and flushed and, and your heart is beating, your adrenaline is spiking. And it's like you are in the combat zone, even though you're just in the parking lot of the get and go. Okay, That's what a trigger is. It's about trauma. And the way that we got into trigger warnings is because somebody pointed out that there is a lot of trauma on college campuses, right? There is an epidemic of sexual assault. Uh, the number for especially women is one in five 
um, your chances of getting uh, raped when college, if you're a woman, is is you know twenty percent or one in five. If you are a man, that's a slightly small. That's a smaller number, but still. So we have this like one in five is a huge number, and unlike the combat veteran at the get and go, who presumably combat was in the past, if I'm facing a lecture hall full of students of a hundred students, and twenty percent of them have. Uh, Tra- trauma about you know they were sexually assaulted it could be as as early as last night mm. right mm-hmm. so that's who i'm talking with and i need to teach my students in a way that they can hear me and one of the ways that psychiatrists or whoever you know psychologists psychiatrists in the medical field the one of the ways that you can avoid those ptsd flashbacks is if you can give say our veteran a heads up right like hey veteran fourth of july is coming and there's going to be a lot of fireworks so that when the fireworks go off their brain has an opportunity to go oh this is not combat actually it's fireworks and they can be in their bodies and not have that trigger response right so Mm -hmm. a trigger warning is about letting traumatized brains have an opportunity to breathe so that they can take in the material right Mm -hmm. so so i think from that perspective, of course, it's a no brainer. If I'm gonna teach a, a play with um, heavy material, material with suicidal ideation, material um, with uh, sexual assault, material with a lot of violence, um, it's a no brainer to say, okay, I want all 100 students in this lecture hall or all 20 students in this discussion to be able to, to hear me. And I know that many of them are traumatized. And so I'm just gonna give them a heads up, hey, suicides mentioned in this play hey there's sexual assault in this play so that their brains can be with us in the discussion right Mm. so from there the trigger warning filters out of the academy right and now goes into the theater industry and people (laughs) are like well we've got to put um trigger warnings on our plays and then there's this real pushback about grumble grumble you're spoiling the spoiling the play but here's where my (laughs) opinion comes in okay i have an opinion strong opinion here yes um, it's not spoiling the play and those people are crybabies that's my opinion okay so if i go to see let's say long day's journey in tonight right and somebody gives me a heads up hey there's um you know suicide and and uh drinking that doesn't take anything away from that play i just go oh what a lovely night in the theater i'm about to have can't this sure is a long day's journey into deep dark night like it's fine. <laughs> it's fine it doesn't actually spoil anything for me but if i have a traumatized brain mm-hmm. it may allow me to stay in the play Play. and i also feel while i'm on my little hobby horse here i also feel that a lot of the resentment and the grievance around trigger warnings like grumble 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 comes from an impulse that some folks have about not wanting to care about other people's feelings Mm. uh and i think that if the trauma that 20 percent of our students were having was not sexual assault was not gendered in that way um, that maybe there wouldn't be such a strong pushback. In other words, friends, misogyny. Mm. Thank you for my um, soapbox at rant over. Megan and Elizabeth, can I ask you questions? Of course. I'm always the practical place. I I deeply hear that, and I keep trying to to figure out what. <laughs> It normally is like 0.02 seconds, not 0.02, but I will say, okay, we're moving into workshop. You're going to start bringing in scripts. Please do consider your classmates. And I've, and I will have tried obviously to have already modeled for them in our course, in our discussions of other scripts, how I'm approaching trigger warnings or content warnings. And if you have a distinction there, I'd love to hear it too. But what do you, what do the two of you tell students about appending trigger warnings to their own scripts particularly i think it's it's i suspect or at least for me i tell them it's a little bit different in a workshop setting when you're trying to develop a thing and you're not entirely sure what you have versus if we're in production um or maybe it isn't maybe you you maybe you're both like no actually it's the exact same thing i'm just curious what are you like what are y'all takeaways thoughts 
when it comes to new plays, like when you have a room full of playwrights, I think it's really important at the top of the class to have a conversation about what our class policy is going to be. And this mm -hmm. is just sort of a larger approach yep. to teaching, right? Which yep. is that thinking about teaching less as a top down, I'm going to inform you of this great knowledge that I have that you don't have, and more circular and collective, and that we are going to learn from one another, which means that we have to um, come up with some collective agreements about how we're going to operate. And yeah. uh, having a conversation about what is the function of a content warning, what is the function of a trigger warning, if you have a good classroom set up and you have a strong uh, classroom where the students all trust one another and trust you, that can be a really wonderful conversation to have at the top of the semester where students yep. can say, yeah, look, and also I, I, uh, I have some family stuff in my background and I need a, a, a trigger warning about this, that topic, you know, like that kind of thing can be, can be really useful. And also it just sort of allows folks to understand that we're not talking to faceless masses, that when we read our plays, we're actually talking to the other people in the room that yeah. the other people in the room are our first audience and they are whole people unto themselves. Yeah. And, I, and I have found that um, my students are happy to extend that courtesy to one another. They don't have a problem with it at all because we're talking about, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's no longer theoretical, right? It's about like these actual people. Like, I don't want, you know, Sandy or Eric to, you know, be upset or or to not be able to engage with my play. Oh, that's the worst. If they weren't, can't read my play. Oh, <laughs> dear God. Especially if I could just give them a heads up and then they could read my play, then that's what I really want. So, well, and I do think there's something, Elizabeth, I love your point about finding those places where students are empowered, right? And I think that's another portion of this, the bigger topic of like empowered, but also care, empowered means you're also, you're also carrying a responsibility. Um, and this is not high school. Now you, this is a learning community and I'm facilitating learning and I carry a certain responsibility, but so do you. Because you reminded me there as well, Megan, like, oh, right. I start every semester with a discussion of community agreements and mm -hmm. those live on our, our website for the class. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the places to really kind of address that. Um, and it then, to the point of our conversation, is a way to set up how do we want to engage each other when we do run up against things where we disagree or we feel we something struck a nerve um, that's difficult that well, is challenging. Well, and that that's a great segue into my next question, which is you know how how do you handle situations when students push back either against the play or against you? or against what someone in class has said? You know, how do you make sure that the conversation remains constructive and productive? Well, there's, there's sort of two different, two different times that I think it's useful to, to draw a distinction between. Um, one is if we're dealing with a new play that a student in the class has written and we're mm. workshopping this new play, right? Mm. Um, that's one set of circumstances. The other is if we're reading an established play, a classic play, um, that the students are encountering for the first time, right? So um, when it's the second, when it's a play that is established, let's say everybody's reading, you know, I don't know, Carol Churchill's Cloud Nine or everybody's reading, whatever we're reading. Um, uh, we're reading Katori Hall's The Mountaintop, whatever we're reading, right? Uh, one of the rules that I have in my class is I say for the purposes of this class, we are going to assume that every play that we read is a masterpiece and that if we don't like it, if we feel outside of it, if we find ourselves bewildered by it, that is our cue to lean in closer, to dig deeper and find out more about it. Um, hmm. But also that doesn't mean you have to like all the plays. And in fact, learning which classic plays you can't stand is an important part of your education. Amen and amen. You for the yes. rest of your life. Yes. And so by all means, go to the bar slash milkshake shop or wherever they go. Go, go, <laughs> through the, go to the place where you go and be like, can you believe Tennessee fucking Williams? Like, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. 
at that spot like that's the time to trash but in the classroom because what we're trying to do is figure out um what can we glean out of this play that we can use for our own education not about um so it's not about celebrating the play it's about milking it because sometimes students will read a play um, I certainly have had this in my own education before, uh, where students will read a play, especially a difficult play or an unusual play or a play that's that's weird, um, and their knee-jerk response is they hate it. And then they get into it and unpack it, and then it becomes their favorite play. And Honey. they get so thrilled about it. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's my method to, because I don't want to rob them of, I don't want them to decide uh, too early. Um, I just want to co-sign everything <laughs> Megan just said, including the that starting place of the two distinctions, because Elizabeth, I love that question. And I do find that, um, at least in my playwriting workshops, we have to separate out those two places of pushback. Um, and I also find this may be because I'm also teaching in the Midwest. So the, the distinction that I will find is that no matter how open I try to make the workshop experience, there is something about the power that I wield as a professor that I would say 70% of my workshops I find out after the fact because someone felt like they weren't supposed to bring that up in, and when I say bring that up, of an actual resistance to something within the con. So there's this like Midwestern politeness that I have to combat or, or that I have to help them see and unpack which they don't necessarily see as a something that's filtering and stopping them from being completely open about where they stand with the piece and i will say what i want to really uh what i have learned is to to model as often as i can as early as i can the behavior and engagement and to megan's point there are, there's always at least one play where i explicitly tell students i am not a fan of this piece and I have programmed it because I need you to understand we still have to do the work of finding out what, what is this playwright doing? How are they doing it? It's speaking to someone, right? In the case that, you know, there's, there's ah. a, there is a play whoo, that I cannot, honey, I can't stand this play um, for so many reasons. And I have programmed it twice and students see me actually sweating in the classroom because there's the end of it makes me want to flip tables and <laughs> this play which shall remain nameless and the playwright have honors up one way and down the other and it's a it's a contemporary piece listen when this podcast recording is over i need to know the name of that yeah, i absolutely will and the, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely point is i really want to co-sign that aspect of having it there and nevertheless doing the work of the analysis and figuring out also embody why am i sweating why am i why is it bringing out rage in me mm. and and also telling the students it's okay to feel strongly let's break let's 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 unpack that and let's also observe why you might have been like i don't care about this play and yet for that person who's in the room with you they're like ah! <laughs> and let's get into that conversation um as safely as you know i don't think there's anything as i don't, don't believe that there's anything that's completely safe i tell students release that notion but as safely as we can so what happens when it's a new play because that's a slightly different situation because also presumably you've got the writer in the room. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's the, the the hard part about teaching playwriting, which is that you can't do it in pieces. You have to do it all at once, right? You can't just like today we're going to talk about dialogue. Like you have to write the whole play every time, and every time it teaches you something, right? And we also want our students to swing for the fences. We want our students to take big big swings and try things out uh and that means sometimes in fact it is inevitable that they're gonna step in it mm. it is inevitable that a playwright with all good intentions is going to write something that uh is upsetting that is um uh obtuse <laughs> 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 they, they'll have missed 
some huge part of the culture that everybody in the room seems to know but them like that's it's inevitable that that is going to happen mm -hmm. um and so knowing that when we have our first day our collective agreement that first week um that's one of the things we talk about like what are we gonna do when that happens what do you want to happen when it's your play and you step in it and how do you want it to be resolved when somebody else steps steps in it and you're a responder like let's talk about what we're gonna what we're gonna do there and we have like a there's like a whole um by talking about it before any of the issues come up um it can take some of the the sting out of some of those conversations because what we all want to do is get better as writers mm -hmm. what we all want to do is is we really want to benefit from all of the different perspectives that are in the room and we want to offer our our comments to one another as gifts right like let me help you write a better play let me give yes. you something that you don't have um because i'm rooting for you because you're my colleague and i want you to do well and so i i, I have this information um and one of the things we say is uh, especially if it's somebody has stepped in your pudding <laughs> Right, they stepped in your pudding. Um, <laughs> you have the right to not um, give that comment right away. Like you can think about it. Like you don't have to be on the hook to like if some if something is not sitting right with you and you need you need seventy two hours to process it. That's okay, mm. right? So that's just a couple of of ways that we go about it. Yeah. I will say, for a variety of reasons. Uh, here at KU, I've been part of a group of folks who lead discussions around hot topics in the classroom, hot moments in the classroom. I don't love that label. <laughs> it's like, oh God, hot moments. Woo! But oh, it takes up a lot of this. And one of the things that I think sometimes we in creative writing fields take for granted, particularly theater folk, is that one of the key ways that we as a field have addressed this is to actually have workshop models for those that do have a workshop process. And so I think that's one of, so first of all, co-sign everything Megan said. That's those are tactics that I definitely co-sign and I would say anyone listening, please use them. So this is me just adding, don't overlook the, or, or discount or take for granted the usefulness of a workshop model and a workshop process. It is a, I think a potentially I, I don't I hope this isn't a spicy comment to me it is so dangerous to have someone walk in present their work and we just open the floor and we're like okay what did you think and I will say in full transparency it surprises me the number of folks who still just basically do that and that there are equity issues there and particularly Elizabeth thank you for convening this conversation this conversation and its topic is exactly why we do need process so students know here's how we based on our community agreements are gonna take up a text and it's a process where as as megan pointed out somebody's gonna step in it and where is the step in the conversation that we have where we can with with respect and with honesty take up you done stepped in it don't think you did it intentionally but here's here's how we are going to respond as audience and receiving what that did to us. For interest of transparency, I still use Liz Lerman and critical response process up one way and down the other. I modify it because sometimes some groups are ready to have the comment step and some are not quite ready for the comment step. That's it, that's it. Yeah, that's 100% um, it. Hmm? Some people love save the cat and other methods. Do what you do. What you do. Just, I do recommend having a process. I'm also a big fan of the anti-racist writing workshop, which yes. talks out um, talks about Liz Lerman. And there's a great quote in it, and I'm flipping through my copy that I keep on my desk, hoping to find it. And of course, I can't find it. But there's a great quote about how the people who want um, brutal honesty are usually like people who already feel welcomed into the workshop space right. because of their identity, um, which I think is really really great and that like when students ask for brutal honesty what they're really saying is take me seriously as a writer please which i will which mm -hmm. i will um but but that you know it's not useful to 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 say mean things it doesn't help you become a better writer you know it's not useful yeah so what 
how do you guys handle situations where you're um, teaching a play that is outside of your experience or outside the experience of the majority of the students in your class, especially if they're not connecting with the material? Well, the first, mm. the, the first step, I think, is we have to acknowledge the reality in the room, mm -hmm. right? So um, it is not unusual for me to have a class of 100% white kids, farm kids from small towns in Iowa, uh, who have come, who, who the, their conception of a play is, um, you're a good man, Charlie Brown, which they were in in high school, and now they have come <laughs> to college, <laughs> and, and everything is a lot harder and weirder, and they're sort of out of their depth already. And then I'm like, welcome to Susan Laurie Parks. <laughs> and they're, like having to um, figure out that the words they're reading on the page is a play. Do you know what I mean? Like they're mm -hmm. like they're looking at you know Top Dog, Underdog, or the America Play, or or you know any any Susan Lee Parks, uh, and they're going, "What does this have to do with you're a good man, Charlie Brown?" <laughs> what is this, <laughs> right? Like they're just like trying to figure out like like what that is. And so um, acknowledging that I think is is important. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. What do you got, Darren? You know, it, it's interesting that you say outside of myself, because when I think about, because I grew up in Kansas and I'm in the crossover generation where I think we finally, as I was coming through high school, we finally were doing some major work about rethinking what we called the canon, that I was reading the majority of things outside myself because they were predominantly white authors for years and years and years. Um, and so what I learned to do with that is to start from the from the place of close reading, like what, so I'm being a little bit repetitive and saying what is on the page. And I think the thing there, so like as always, cosine Megan, one thing that white supremacy does is it centers a white narrative. And so the first step when we're like, when people are butting up against, I don't, I can't access this, I don't know this, one, mm, might be it's not for you. Could be that the audience, mm, that was sorry for you. Doesn't mean you get to check out, to be clear, but maybe that was intentional, two. And to actually think about what happens if we center, and what do we, and that means normally unpacking, what do we mean by centering? Da, da, da. So that's that's a conversation that also has to be had. But if we make this experience at the core of the conversation as opposed to the other, the margin, it's weird. What happens if we say it's normal? What do we see? Give it like release that. Let's pretend this is completely normed. And that's not and let's not pretend. Let's say, because in the world of this piece, it is, it is completely normed. What does that do? Um that's one place where the conversation goes. Uh, I will also say I normally find that I have to keep in my back pocket contextual stuff, right? At some point, I have to pull out, here's a review. Here's an interview. Um, those sorts of things become vital uh, to parse it. And, and because we're theater artists, what did, what did actors who worked with it struggle with, particularly if it's a piece that is thorny and there is work where people talk about, I mean, again, actors, directors, designers are so flippin' brilliant. And so many of the times the things that, that we are struggling with as readers are things they were the first people to struggle with, right? And so I love having done some of that to say, and, and here's the other, so that's another tactic. I also have been known to program work by my friends. And so like, hey, can you zoom, and now we have Zoom, can you zoom in? And I will tell students like, are you struggling with something in the script? Hey, why don't you ask the person who created it? What, you know, what that was. So that's another just sort of practical way that I, when I know that I'm not, I don't have the spoons, I don't have the expertise, if it's, those are the ways that I work. And I love programming work from people that I know who are wildly different from me. So I can be like, I'm glad you asked that, stu my student. So-and-so is going to be joining us on September 16th. And I want you, I'm going to, and I will warn them. I'll be like, and 
I will actually call on you to ask that question or I'll just put you on the spot. <laughs> let's, um, let's just talk about white people for a second. Um, because, you know, I'm thinking about James Baldwin talks about white innocence and how the project of white innocence, um, that in order for white people to not lose their minds, having um, created all this tragedy, uh, the, the way that they live with themselves is um, to create distort reality to preserve their mm. white innocence, right? Right. So like this, I, this, this project to protect the innocence of white people so that they don't they so they have plausible deniability about the horrors of of american history is is a real thing and i have in the past few years one of the things that i am doing when i'm teaching primarily white people and we're talking about uh plays of, with black playwrights or indigenous playwrights or players of color right is that we talk explicitly before we talk about the play we talk explicitly about white supremacy we talk about white innocence and i i have a whole powerpoint <laughs> i do this whole <laughs> sort of framing to sort of to get these like 18 19 20 year old students kind of caught up in just sort of the get them to sort of see the bubble wrap that they've been wrapped in their whole life that is preventing them from um, seeing what is obvious to people who are outside of that bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. So we have this whole conversation and still mm -hmm. I'll teach say top dog underdog and I'll say, why are their names Lincoln and Booth? And they'll be like, oh, any other reason besides race? I can't, th it must be some other reason. It has to do with, right? Like they will go out of their way, no way. <laughs> to avoid saying, uh, to avoid talking about race, but because there, there is so ingrained in them, right? Like this is a hot button and I shouldn't see it and I need to protect my innocence. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes just sort of like talking about that in a way that is kind, that in a way that is rooted in everybody's humanity, Right. If we can just sort of like acknowledge the reality. Right. Um, yeah. So many of my students are so afraid about being wrong or being embarrassed mm -hmm. that they will shut down rather than risk that. And so my job as a professor is to create a room where people can feel like it's OK to hazard a guess and be wrong. And it gets tricky. Um, because I have multiple audiences, right? So yes, primarily white students. Yeah, but not exclusively white students right. a lot of the time. And right. I don't want to make the other mistake, which is catering solely to the white kids, right? Mm -hmm. And not, you know, or solely to the cis kids, right? Uh -huh. Or solely to the straight kids without, pardon me, adult learners. Adult learners is what I meant, not kids. <laughs> 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 talk about sort of the multiplicity of, of voices in the room and so that's the that is the trick i think to professoring yeah. in the 20th and and it's a reminder everything that you just have reminded me to megan that this is this is hard work what we do i mean maybe we don't say that often enough and I, i'm the first to say i understand i'm not out here curing cancer is always you know the famous line and I, I get that. And also to do this well and to do this responsibly is more than a notion. And as, as we would say in my family, uh, and it takes that kind of careful consideration. I actually have to meditate uh, because I have anxiety because of all these things. I actually have to meditate before each class. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to go in <laughs> to, to quote the old saints about the church I grew up in, I got to go in and pray it up. <laughs> um, because exactly what, what you're describing, Megan, is like, I have to ask myself, go through the checklist. Have I actually prepared the class to have the conversation that I want them to have? Have I prepared them process-wise so they can roll with anything that's coming in from their, their colleagues in the work that they're presenting? Do I need to change my process? Am I being transparent enough in those changes to, to be ready for all of that? And I think it's important for us to teach our students um, how to contextualize this work because ultimately what they're writing is informed by the world around them as well, right? Making sure that they connect why this writer wrote this play 
at that moment in time helps them connect to the why now question of the work that they're doing too, right? Yeah. And I appreciate too what you said is that there's so many tools that come from our field. And the, the thing is to, I want you to use those tools that you're learning in other courses to apply in an equitable and just and challenging way to this, right? You might, understandably, you're scared about saying the right or wrong thing. Well, let's go at it from this way. Why this play now? Who is it speaking to? What moment is it speaking to? Speaking of sort of moments in time, we're in this very interesting moment in time, scary moment in time. Um, and we're all teaching in states where public education in particular is under attack, um, where these plays that we are teaching, the content of these plays, the ideas of these plays are under attack. How do we keep these stories alive? How do we continue teaching these stories? How do we make sure that our students see the value in these stories? Uh, I'll just say, I think the lesson of this moment in history for all of us is that there is no such thing as a neutral, objective point of view. That, that there is no such thing as an apolitical stance or an apolitical reading or like, I'm just going to teach, I'm going to teach um, Hamlet and I'm going to teach it, you know, the whitest play in the world. I'm going to teach <laughs> this play and it's, and I'm just going to be neutral and I don't want to get politics involved. Like I appreciate and, and I really empathize with that, that longing as a way to kind of circumvent the um, aggressors who are uh, trying to, uh, turn our society into a, a fascist state. I appreciate, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and also it's impossible. So mm. I think the, the, we have to first acknowledge that, that it is impossible to avoid this conversation and be ethical and be true to our mission. You know, I teach at the University of Iowa and our mission is really clear. It's about discovery. It's about diversity of voices and experiences, not for some sort of um, kumbaya thing, not for some, you know, make the world a better place. Although, wouldn't it be great, right? right. It's, um, it's because we are smarter when we are surrounded by different points of view. We are smarter when different people are looking at a problem together. Uh, we are better and we want to create knowledge. And so we can't back away from the lived reality of our lives. And that is hard and that is uncomfortable. And here's where I look to my tenured colleagues to um, please lead the way. <laughs> Because it's a lot more, it's a lot more dangerous for people who are not tenured, who are mm. easily dismissed. And yet also I have to live with myself. Mm. Right? Like I have to live with myself and I have to teach my students how to navigate questions like, how do you know what's true? Mm. How can you tell? You know, people are telling you all kinds of things. How, how, do you, how do you know what's true? Let's start there, right? There are actual things that we can teach that I believe a college education, a liberal arts education can help us through this difficult time, but we have to be um, brave about it. Mm. Uh, I know this is this is recorded, so y'all can't see my face. Like I, I look like a deacon sitting at the Missionary Baptist front front pew. I'm like, yeah, mm. um, it's a sermon. I mean, what Megan said, I just it, it, it's so much what is also my politic um, as an instructor, and also I'm call, I feel called in as someone who is tenured. So I think for those of us who understand the tenure system which I think is is the dismantling of it is underway and it will go forward. And so I think that is very prescient, what you pointed out there about using the power that still exists within that system responsibly and to be brave. I was really, I love that question that you asked that got us here. And um, I think the way we keep those things alive is the bravery that Megan's talking about and also knowing that <sighs> students, no matter what, one of the things that I love about the creative writing workshop is that students are going to come in with their narratives and their truths 
built, carried in their bodies. And so I could, I could do a curriculum completely based on some banana pants thing that some person, uh, let me not get too nasty, um, that some <laughs> fascist leaning person wants me to do. And still it is my job to create a spring, I, I still would never be able to completely keep out challenging, marginalized, intriguing narratives out of the classroom because those are going to come in anyhow via what my students have lived. So better I be responsible and create a receptive place rather than trying to do the impossible, which is to hold the door and be like, we're only going to do the things that these random people not in this classroom deem as safe when you are the one student who has paid money to be here and is carrying all of this joy and trauma and lived life and you're gonna draw on that, better I be responsible and ready and have built in work that yes, whether you're white, whether you're whatever, whatever your background, you feel ready to be challenged and challenging in your work. Um, understanding that that is always going to be the call and that that is always going to be there is the other piece that I would add. And I just want to throw in, this is obvious, or we've been taking this for granted, but just so that it's spoken, this narrative that professors are trying to indoctrinate their students with their woke agenda is such hot garbage. Hot garbage. Uh, it's such hot, like, I can't get my students to do the readings. Like, they're not going to sit still for the Communist Manifesto. I'll just Honey. Say, like, that is, <laughs> that's not really happening. Right, this idea that it's not, it's just not really happening. Uh, and they want to say that it's happening so that they can control speech, right? So they can control mm -hmm. ideas. Um, and, you know, I, I get it, right? But but it's, it's it's not right, it's not accurate. <laughs> it's so not we accurate. Have, <laughs> we have to start with, with the truth and that what a college degree, especially um, um, an undergraduate Bachelor of Arts in the liberal arts is about, is about critical thinking. Nope. That's what it's about. And critical thinking requires you to live in the real world and not the imaginary world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have, we're in a, we're in a, in 2023, about 30% of Americans are trying to live in an imaginary world. Ooh. And that you, you can't get smarter if you live in an imaginary world, you actually have to grapple with, you know, it's, we didn't make it up. Like it's, it's not, that racism exists, that sexism and homophobia, transphobia exists. There are just whole wings of the library. Like I wish <laughs> they didn't exist. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was just a narrative? I'd love to come into classroom and be like, Doo -doo -doo -doo, discrimination's over, we solved it everybody. Like, wouldn't that be wonderful? wonderful? That would be amazing, but it's not true. And every time we do a, a, an experiment, every time we, we, we look, to see if attitudes are different, we find a lot of these same issues that America has been stubbing their toe on since its inception are still with us. And so we have to acknowledge that reality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that part. Excellent, it seems like a great place to stop. Thank you guys so much <laughs> for your time, for your wisdom, for your humor. Um, I appreciate you being here with us today. And, Elizabeth, uh, you are wonderful. You are divine. Thank you, guys. This podcast is produced as a contribution to HowlRound Theatre Commons. You can find more episodes of this show and other HowlRound shows wherever you find podcasts. Be sure to search HowlRound Theatre Commons Podcasts and subscribe to receive new episodes. If you love this podcast, post a rating and write a review on those platforms. This helps other people find us. You can also find a transcript for this episode, along with a lot of other progressive and disruptive content, on HowlRound.com. Have an idea for an exciting podcast, essay, or TV event the theater community needs to hear? Visit HowlRound.com and submit your ideas to this digital commons.